Tuesday, April the 26th, 2022, and welcome back to Goodfellows, a Hoover Institution broadcast examining social, economic, political, and geopolitical concerns. I'm Bill Whalen. I'm a Hoover Distinguished Policy Fellow. I'll be your moderator today. I'd like to introduce you to the stars of our show. Three of my colleagues we jokingly refer to as Hoover's Goodfellows. That would be the historian Neil Ferguson, the economist John Cochran, geostrategist Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster. They are Hoover Institution Senior Fellows all. Gentlemen, it's good to see you after a week off, and I thought we'd do something a little different this week. This is going to be what we call a BYOT show, as in bring your own topic. John Cochran, why don't you begin? Well, it's such a pleasure. Uh, One of the pleasures I get out of this show is the chance to nail my two uh, working, my hard traveling colleagues to the uh, floor for 15 minutes and ask them hard questions about things I don't understand. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, uh, and, and, and I have a two-part question, uh, which was a little bit both HR and, and Neil. So first, um, uh, this week was supposed to be the grand tank battle in uh, in uh, Eastern Ukraine, uh, replaying the Battle of Kursk or something of the sort. And I'm, since I, I now I happen to know somebody who was a tank commander and can tell us something about how these things work. Uh, in particular, I'm, I'm, it doesn't seem to be happening. I'd be curious uh, how you would be handling it if you were Ukrainian. I'm, I'm interested that they seem to be digging immense trenches and fortifications. Is this a big Maginot line? I, I would have thought they would have played for maneuver space, let the Russians move in a little bit, stretch their supply lines, and then close in. But given what they got, you know, what, what would you be doing? And related, the other week's news, and this is for both of you, the, the larger, from the small to the large, the geostrategic question. The U.S. is now at war with Russia. Uh, we have uh, announced war aims that include uh, Vladimir Putin must leave power, uh, that there's gonna be war crimes trials. And, and most recently in Ukraine, our defense secretary and secretary of state said that the long run goal was to weaken uh, Russia uh, militarily. Uh, we're, we're, I think, creditably ramping up uh, supplies of all the heavy weapons they need, not just to defend, but to go on the attack. Great, but but uh, Neil was a little worried about where this is all going last week. By the way, things are now suspiciously blowing up in Russia, uh, not just in Ukraine, which ought to make uh, Neil, Neil Neil a little bit worried. So so I'm I'm now every man. What, what about that, guys? Tell us what's going on. Start with HR, and then yeah, well, I'll, I'll say we're we're not more at war with Russia than we were at war with. Uh, with Nazi Germany in in 1939, 40, until December of 41. So the the role that we are playing is a role that is analogous to the role that we played in in, in the uh, in, in World War II prior to U.S. Um, entry. So, but I, the Russians have formally complained about us sending weapons. Did, did the Nazis formally complain? They must have. Oh, like, yeah, they they did. <laughs> and, 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 they did. And uh, you know, and, and obviously they acted to interdict a lot of the Lend-Lease material and so forth that was that was you know, that was flowing uh, to uh, to the the Allies, in, including you know, in, including the Soviet Union. You know, With so. submarines, not diplomatic notes. Sorry for interrupting. Go on, go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. So, so I, you know, I, I think that the you know the war rhetoric, the complaints by Russia. You know, can, what's Russia going to do? I, I mean, I, I think Russia ought to fear escalation more than we do. And of course, uh, you know. Um, Niels pointed out, and I think it's it's right to be concerned about the most destructive weapons on Earth. Russia can still do quite a bit, even though its military has shown that it is inept in its ability to to maintain a sustained offensive across any distance and against a, a capable defending enemy. Of course, they can still rubble cities, right? They can still fire missiles at rail lines as they and rail stations as they've done just in, in recent hours. Uh, they can, you know, they can rattle the nuclear saber and, and threaten us and so forth. Uh, they can maybe still have some cyber tools up their sleeve, but I think we're going to learn in, the, in maybe several years from now what we've been doing to preempt massive uh, Russian cyber attacks. We've learned a little bit about that. There have been some leaks, but but not. I think there's more behind to that story. But John, you know, I'll just I'll just go to your the first part of your question, then because Neil, I think I'd like to hear what your thoughts are in terms of are we you know are we at war with Russia, which I, I don't believe we are. I don't believe that Russia wants to escalate. I think they're I think the Lithuanian army could march on on Saint Petersburg right now, uh, based on on uh, on on what's happened to the Russian military and the, and the losses they've suffered and the forces they've committed uh, just to this one one theater. So for an effective offensive operation, what do you need to do? You need to be able to conduct effective reconnaissance. 
to, to gain an understanding of your defending the enemy so you can make contact with that enemy under favorable conditions. And that entails the, the, the application of fires, you know, fires to kind of shape that battlefield in advance of advancing troops. Uh, and it involves then conducting shifting to close combat from the deep fight to close combat with a combination of fire and, and, and maneuver, where you're posing multiple dilemmas to the enemy. You want to strike the enemy from unexpected locations. You want to be able to then to then penetrate defenses and, and then sustain an offensive that allows you either to envelop an enemy or to turn an enemy out of defensive positions. So, that, so they have to leave prepared ground and then meet you uh, where, where you, can, you can gain an advantage associated with a meeting engagement rather than impaling yourself on, on prepared positions. What the, then what, what you have to be able to do is to sustain that offensive over distance. You know, it's, it's important to understand the Russians could not sustain a hundred mile deep offensive operation in the north. But of course, in the north, you might think about that as fighting the battle, the battle, John of Chicago, right? If you're trying to take, you know, if you're trying, it's like trying to take the city of Chicago, where defenders have you know, tremendous advantages. Now they're trying to create a penetration in the Battle of Iowa in the, in the eastern part of the uh, eastern part of Ukraine. But to do that is going to again, they're going to have to sustain that offensive over distances. Off-road maneuverability is not great. So what what the Ukrainians are doing is they're they're employing a combination of what we call area defense, where you, where you're defending key areas or strong points that you're using to kind of shape the enemy offensive around those, and that has to be combined with mobile defense, where oftentimes you trade your space for time and 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 allow the enemy to penetrate in certain areas so they reach what what you know Clausewitz coined the term culminating point of the offense and that's the point at which the offense is no longer strong enough uh to 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 penetrate the defense and and the shift in the balance between defense and offense at that culminating point shifts toward the defensive and then what you want to be able to do and this is why some of these additional capabilities are important you want, again, what Clausewitz called the flashing sword of vengeance in the defense, which is the counteroffensive. And this is why you see with the major offensives in, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the Western uh, theater uh, dur during World War II, when Germany counterattacked after D-Day, for example, and after the Operation Cobra, this is the Falaise Gap battle, for example. And there's a great book by Martin Blumenson called The Battle of the Generals. I highly recommend it. I mean, it was just because it compares and contrasts different American allied generals' attitudes toward that penetration. And it's Montgomery, uh, principally Bradley, Eisenhower, and Patton. You know what Patton's <laughs> inclination was? He's like, hey, let him go to the channel. You know, just let him go. And then we can counterattack. And just go to Berlin. So I, I think what, what you're seeing or, you, or what you'll see develop are some some battlefield sort of uh, geometrics associated with time and space positioning of forces. But, you know, I don't think the Russians can do it. They can't consolidate uh, the gains in, in the east. I don't think they're going to get many gains uh, and many more gains in the east because the problems we've seen in their military, you can't solve those problems in a couple of months. And the problems are, are discipline, training. You know, leadership competence, ability to integrate all arms into the fight, the ability to conduct effective reconnaissance, and as we mentioned, logistics, right? The ability to sustain an operation. So what, what they can do is they continue, they can continue to rubble, you know, cities. They can continue to use fires massively. But I don't see any evidence that they're going to be able to sustain an offensive in the Battle of Iowa in eastern Ukraine. Well, I don't disagree with anything that HR just said. Uh, though I'd love to have heard more about why uh, Russian tanks have been uh, so vulnerable in this war. Uh, they, they have sustained enormous uh, damage to their armor. And it raises the question, is the tank a, a 20th century weapon uh, that suddenly finds itself in a 21st century battlefield, highly vulnerable uh, to drones uh, and to precision weapons uh, that can be fired from the shoulder of, uh, of, a, of a Ukrainian soldier. Uh, we, we could come back to that. But the question that you threw at me, John, uh, which HR also answered is, are we in fact at war with Russia? And I agree with HR, we're not. Uh, but we are supplying uh, increasingly destructive weapons to Ukraine and signaling ever more explicitly that we wish Ukraine to win this war, or at least 
for Russia not to win it, which amounts to the same thing. The fact that the Secretary of State, Defense Secretary, went to Kyiv and met with uh, President Zelensky is another sign of our growing uh, commitment. And uh, what I'm asking myself is, what's the end game? Richard Haas had a good piece in Foreign Affairs asking the same question. I don't know what exactly was discussed in Kyiv, but I think the obvious uh, question to ask is, how can we stop this war? Because the longer it lasts, the more dangerous I think it becomes. If HR is right and the Russians fail in the battle of the Donbass, his Iowa, if they fail in this final uh, effort to have something that they can call a victory, what are Putin's options? And I've been arguing for some time, and I noticed that uh, the Director of Central Intelligence, Bill Burns, shares my concern that Putin has an option to use a tactical nuclear weapon if he's failed to win the war conventionally. And we shouldn't uh, rule out that possibility. He's shown himself ready to violate other norms repeatedly, not only in this war. Uh, so it seems to me that it's extremely important for uh, Ukraine and its supporters to have a clear end game if we're not to have a war that could not only drag on destructively, but also escalate uh, with the potential use of, of nuclear or at least chemical weapons. And I, I I think the, hard, the longer this war lasts, the harder it becomes to say what the end state is, and the less and less likely a ceasefire, much less a peace, uh, becomes. I think there's also a danger uh, that we get so directly involved in the Ukrainian war effort that the Russian claim that they're fighting NATO starts to become plausible. We already have people training the Ukrainians in the use of these weapons, as I understand it. Uh, there are gray areas that we, I think, are entering at this point. The final point I'd make, John, is one that goes right back to you. Economic warfare is a long established complement to the stuff that the military does in battle. And we have pursued a very interesting kind of economic warfare uh, against Russia. Uh, it was oversold at the beginning of this war. We were told that financial sanctions would cripple Russia, and they haven't done that, uh, not least because the Russians have continued to sell oil and gas to Europe. But, but as we speak, it feels to me as if the German government's position is crumbling and they're about to agree to the oil embargo. At least that sounded very much like uh, what I was hearing from Berlin earlier today. Uh, so watch that, because the economic war could be stepped up in a decisive way quite imminently. The other thing to watch is the slow burn of Russia's economy as it is cut off from imports of uh, sophisticated components. This is not Stalin's Soviet Union. The Russian economy since the 1990s has been a relatively open economy, and it relies heavily on imported semiconductors and other precision and other high value parts. Uh, for its industry, not only its defense industry, but its civilian industry. The longer the war goes on, and Putin must know this, the worse this gets for Russia economically. Uh, and so he does have some incentive uh, to settle. I think we need to think much harder about how to get to that closure without which this war drags on. And as I say, the risk of escalation grows. And then if I can, uh, that is... Um... Uh, so suppose the, once things slow down for Russia, the Ukrainians may say, hey, we're winning. Time for us to take back everything. Right. Uh, and, and perhaps these negotiations where you have to leave, leave something in, in the bowl for, for Putin, because if the scenario is Ukrainians start winning, take back their country, including Crimea, including blowing up things inside Russia, with the US uh, devastating Russia's economy and military, with a now a stated war aim that we want to weaken Russia militarily and economically so it won't cause trouble. We want to get rid of Vladimir Putin and start war crimes trials. Mm -hmm. um, e even I start to feel, feel a little bit worried about where this is going. So perhaps what the secretaries of state and, and uh, what, what they were doing is saying, look, we, we have to leave something on the table for Putin, but that's extremely unappetizing as well. I, I agree with you. Uh, if we settle in, what we're settling in for is devastating the Russian economy, devastating the Russian military, which it will do. They, they, need, they need to buy chips just like everybody else in order to get stuff to run uh, and, and, and deliberately weaken the country. 
Uh, that that sounds pretty dangerous. That's why I'm, I'm unsure even about where to go, which is why I was asking you. Yeah, I'll just I'll just I can't believe should make a counterpoint here. You know, <laughs> what is leaving something on the on the ta table for food? Like and, and you know, how does how does that how does that reduce the risk of escalation? I mean. You know, Putin has aspirations beyond those that are in reaction to what we do, right? And he's proven that since 2000. The only way, I think, to constrain Putin is to convince him he's been defeated. And the only way to do that, I think, is if Ukraine wins. And by win, I would say Ukraine is able to restore at least uh, the, you know, uh, control of the territories that they controlled uh, after 2014 and before the renewed offensive on February 24th of this year. So... I mean, I, I would say that that means Russia's defeated. But you know, if there's something left on the table for Putin, his general already mistakenly said, hey, our goal is to take over the entire southern coast of, of Ukraine and to connect it to Transnistria and, and, and Moldova. We already see what he's doing more broadly in Europe, right? Weaponizing migrants on, Pol on Polish support. Hey, he already occupied Belarus, by the way, you know, while we weren't paying attention. Right? And then, and then uh, you know, he has designs, uh, strategic designs in Syria and Eastern Libya. You know, he's, he's rekindling uh, ethnic violence potentially, you know, in, in the Balkans uh, would like to, I think. So, you know, I, you know, the threats to the Baltic states remain. I mean, this this is so I, I think the only way to, is to convince him he's been defeated. And so, and uh, and and so I I don't agree with, you know, leaving something on the table for him. Uh, and I was like, I'm, yeah. I'm, and you said I'm the original hawk in this discussion. <laughs> and I, you know, until every Russian soldier is out of all of Ukraine, including Crimea, we the West have not said this ends now. We don't do things this way. And I, 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 so can I, can I, can I talk about tanks? Can I talk about tanks for a minute? Yeah, let's go back to okay. tanks. Or so, because I mean, it's one of my favorite things to talk about. Hey, but the, you know, what, what a tank is, a tank is mobile protected firepower. And it is one arm it, of, among others, which is infantry and fires that allow you to conduct combined arms operations. There are many other uh, arms that you have to employ, electromagnetic warfare, aviation, unmanned aerial systems, air defense capabilities. And the, the key to being competent as a combined arms warrior is to be able to integrate all of those capabilities to present your enemy with multiple dilemmas, to seize the initiative. You want your enemy worried about their ass, not what they're going to do to you. And, and to do that, you, you have to be able to uh, to, to employ fires against concentrated enemy such that they disperse. Oh, and then when they disperse, what happens? Maneuver, mobile protected firepower combined with, with infantry to place something of value to that enemy at risk. Then what do they do? Well, they have to concentrate to defend against you. Guess what? Hey, the fires are right there. They're ready, right? Of course, they're going to employ capabilities against you, like unmanned aerial systems and aviation. That's what you have air defense for. You disrupt their command and control with electromagnetic warfare, attacking their command posts, attacking them in depth to parallel or paralyze them. So this is what the Russians can't do. They're not trained to do it. They're, they're, they're not trained as combined arms warriors. And as a former you know, cavalry officer, right, it, you, you must conduct effective reconnaissance to, to determine the strength and disposition of the enemy and the enemy's fighting power, the, the, the moral element, you know, how much resistance are they going to put up? They're leading with their nose. So if you drive a tank into an ambush, guess what? I mean, you're going to get blown up. So it's it, it, the tank itself is something you always want because otherwise you're maneuvering against the enemy with like, you know, with body armor, right? <laughs> and, and so mobile protected firepower will always be important to winning in, in battle, but only if it's integrated with all arms. And that bell you heard was uh, either dinner is served or else it's time to move on to a new segment, which will be Neil's turn. Uh, I think we should return to this topic at some future point because I'm particularly interested in Neil and the idea of the tactical nuke and HR. I'd like to hear how exactly a tactical nuke would be deployed. And then Neil, what are the, how does the West react to it? But Neil, it's your turn. It's your 15 minutes of fame. What's your topic today? Well, that bell, maybe also the way that HR was talking made me think I might be in the boxing ring. <laughs> And I was expecting you to say seconds out round two, uh, and I don't have my gloves on. I'm going to change the subject, though there is a connection. Meanwhile, at the other end of Eurasia, something went wrong with Xi Jinping's zero COVID policy. And this is almost as consequential, though it's less spectacular, than what's going on in Ukraine. The connection, in my view, is that 
when we talk about Russia, we're also implicitly talking about China, because as I've been saying for the last four years, this is Cold War II, and unlike in Cold War I, China's now the senior partner, Russia's the junior partner. But what's happening in China is so distracting the Chinese Communist Party that I suspect they don't have much time to think about Putin's failing war. Uh, they have their own failing war, and that is the war against COVID-19. As you all remember, the SARS-CoV-2 virus originated in Wuhan in China over two years ago. Uh, and after the initial outbreak in uh, Wuhan and its surrounding environs, uh, the Chinese government brought the uh, pandemic under control in their own territory. There was no exponential growth in any other province apart from Hebei, uh, where Wuhan is located. And thereafter, the Chinese government enjoyed boasting about the success of China's containment of the virus as compared with our woeful failure to uh, control the spread of the virus once it reached our shores. This boastfulness uh, continued uh, later in 2020 with the claim that China's vaccines would also save the world, its personal uh, protective equipment having already done some of that. And this is what uh, we uh, call hubris, uh, borrowing from the terminology of ancient Greek tragedy, the hubris of Xi Jinping, that China's zero COVID policy was the best in the world, that China's vaccines would soon be a boon to the world. All of this uh, has been followed uh, this year by nemesis. Uh, nemesis in the form of an, uh, a variant Omicron, which uh, it just can't control, other than through such drastic lockdown measures uh, that the Chinese economy grinds uh, to a halt. And if you look at some of the, the data coming out of China, two things are immediately striking. Number one, what's already happened in Hong Kong, a huge surge of not just Omicron infection, but fatalities, uh, has happened, uh, although on a somewhat smaller scale in Shanghai, and could happen in other Chinese cities. Uh, point two, the contraction in economic activity that they're having to bring about to contain the spread is as severe as we saw in early 2020. Uh, and so this is a huge deal. I think Xi Jinping is uh, hoist by his own petard, if you want to go Shakespearean. He can't easily abandon zero COVID, because what would that entail? Well, it would entail importing Western vaccines. Since China's vaccines don't work, uh, not only do they not work, they haven't been terribly effectively distributed. 40% of elderly Chinese over 80 aren't vaccinated at all. But he's not going to do that. He's committed his reputation, his credibility too much to zero COVID. It's become one of those propaganda slogans uh, that have been such a characteristic feature of the history of the People's Republic of China. So watch carefully, because China is now in extraordinary difficulty. Uh, the economic consequences of this are going to be really quite significant. Uh, China's demand for oil is way down because China's transportation has grown to a halt. And Chinese supply chains, which were already kind of a mess, are really a very big mess now. You only have to look at the number of ships stuck offshore near the Shanghai port to see just how big a shock this is. So that seems to me as big a deal, actually, as the war in Ukraine, even if it is somewhat spe less spectacular. Mm -hmm. Neil, if I, was I don't know if you saw Xi Jinping's comments just in the past couple of days about how it's important to really double down on economic growth right now as well, to surpass the United States. And, you know, I just I would like to ask you and John, okay, so we have now the, you know, we have the, the, the mishandling of, of COVID, right? The zero COVID approach. We, we now see another reason why it was a mistake to concentrate so much of the world's <laughs> you know, manufacturing on the southeastern coast of China. There, so there are maybe doubts about that and maybe a need to nearshore, offshore, or as Secretary Yellen said recently, friendshore some manufacturing. Uh, there seems to be significant financial strain in China, not only now in the real estate sector, but I think there's a great deal of sort of quantitative easing. You guys would know better than I would that's happening uh, really in China's race. Are they creating even more vulnerabilities in, in their race to surpass us? And what are the prospects, just broadly, from an economic dimension, uh, uh, what are the prospects uh, of our, uh, uh, our economic competition uh, with China? Well, uh, the hubris took another uh, uh, turn for the worse when they uh, proclaimed the growth target of 5.5%. For this year, there's no way 
they're going to make that, though no doubt they'll cook the books. But there's going to be a really big discrepancy between the official growth number and the reality. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, uh, they've brought uh, Li Keqiang, uh, the uh, premier, back to the fore. Uh, he tends to be kind of wheeled out when there's uh, economics to do. Uh, but it's not clear to me what exactly they can do uh, to keep this show on the road. Uh, there's been some monetary easing, but not quantitative easing. Uh, they, they don't do anything as radical as that. Uh, but that easing uh, has mostly manifested itself so far in a weakening of the Chinese currency. Uh, ultimately, as we learned from 2020, uh, if you're shutting down your economy, there's no fiscal and monetary stimulus you can do uh, any more than if you jam the brakes on uh, your car, uh, hitting the gas won't would make it move forward. So I, I don't think there is a really straightforward solution unless they were prepared to ditch zero COVID, buy a bunch of Pfizer vaccines uh, and admit defeat. And that, that just seems to me politically inconceivable. Remember, this is the year when Xi Jinping gets uh, his third term confirmed by a party congress in the fall. My sense is that uh, his credibility is now so bound up with uh, zero COVID, uh, and uh, of course, uh, continuing uh, economic growth that we'll have to see between now and October, November, a continuation of zero COVID and a cooking of the economic books to make it look like China's economy is growing when it won't be. John? So let me comment just a little bit. So for, first of all, this surpassing the US stuff, it's distinguished GDP versus GDP per capita. Uh, China is still a very poor country. I don't have the numbers handy, but their GDP per capita is is like a quarter of the United States. This is that there's just you see the pretty shiny parts, but uh, there's lots and lots of parts that aren't so pretty in China. They're just a, there's a lot of capitas, and they have huge long run problems. So so good luck to them on on the surpassed part and the part that counts. Yes. Yeah, so China's issue, if you want to grow by a factor of four which is what you need to have a prosperity like the US is. This is not about printing money or fiscal stimulus. This is about the, the good old fashioned parts of economic supply side uh, economic development, which take a while. Uh, and that don't, don't come from grand plans and state industries as well. Um, this, but I, I, so where are they headed? It's not really that much of an economic or health problem. Yes, they blew it. Uh, their, their ability to run a surveillance state and have zero COVID for a while, should have given them the two years that any military commander like HR would say, well, this is the time you build the trenches and stock the ammunition. Uh, they could have vaccinated the whole population uh, and, and expanded their health system so that they can take care of people who get sick, learn from the rest of the world to uh, you know, not, not worry about young people. Don't close the schools, which has been just an utter disaster in the United States. The, the new numbers coming out on that are, are just really sad. Protect the old people. Uh, do you know? And, and then they could have had a, a mild COVID. And even if they do, you know, even if they learn as slowly as we do, what do they have? They'll have a horrible recession and then a V-shaped recovery uh, uh, once it passes, and and just sort of repeat our disasters. Now, you know, no, uh, our politics aren't that great either. But uh, at least uh, you know we're not in in political. In fact, it's remarkable how little accountability there is for the disastrous policies of our own uh, COVID. So I think uh, uh, how I put together what you're saying is. Uh, yes, uh, they're headed to repeat what we did. Uh, too bad they didn't have a chance to learn the lessons. Uh, and that, but what I'm listening, what I'm hearing is this is primarily a political uh, problem. Uh, Xi Jinping is at a very delicate moment when he's either we're either going to get rid of the regular rotation of, uh, of party heads, or we're going to anoint him the new Mao. Uh, and that is, and of course, the reason there are a, a dictatorship is because they're very worried about support. I, I would be surprised if people in Shanghai are happy about what's going on right now and how long they'll tolerate it. So, uh, you know, the the, the uh, fragility of an autocratic system shows up exactly in times like this. So I, I would read it. You're exactly right from what I tell of what's what's going on. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're, they just have much less capacity to absorb these kind of mistakes. We have plenty of capacity to absorb mistakes, it seems. <laughs> right. Neil, speaking of Mao, in the 1950s, China had a problem, sparrows in particular, the birds. The Chinese government came to the conclusion that the sparrows were eating too much of crops. And so they engaged upon a gigantic program to eradicate sparrows, and they succeeded. They killed about 2 billion wow. sparrows. And by doing so, they created a new problem. No birds, bugs run amok, infestation of crops. 
My question, Neil, is do the Chinese, when they come to solutions such as zero COVID, do they look at their own history and see how big government solutions fail? Well, this is an opportunity to uh, sing the praises of uh, a couple of our, our colleagues at the Hoover Institution. Uh, Frank Dakota, uh, of course, wrote Mao's Great Famine, a fantastic uh, book about the disastrous consequences of Mao's Great Leap Forward. Right. Uh, but he, he's also uh, written uh, two companion volumes, one on the 1949 revolution and the subsequent uh, social revolution uh, in China, and the other on the cultural revolution. And, and my takeaway from those brilliant books is that the way the CCP has consistently functioned since Mao uh, has been to set some grandiose target, usually encapsulated in a slogan, and an unleash tremendous and often destructive energies that it's very hard to turn off. And this continued after Mao. Uh, sometimes it unleashed really positive uh, energies. Think of Deng Xiaoping's uh, opening up, uh, which really began uh, China's meteoric economic rise. But think also of the much less uh, successful and indeed very harmful policy of, of restricting families to, to one child, which was another Deng Xiaoping innovation. Uh, one Belt, One Road uh, was a Xi Jinping slogan which sent uh, Chinese uh, capital and uh, labor all over the world for projects, uh, both successful and unsuccessful. And that brings me to the other Hoover scholar who's worked brilliantly on this, Ike Freiman, uh, who will be joining us uh, in, in a while as one of our Hoover fellows. He's already published a fantastic book on the One Belt, One Road initiative. He has forthcoming in the Wall Street Journal a brilliant essay on why zero COVID is just the latest of these crazy CCP campaigns that takes on a life of its own and is very hard to turn off even when it's become uh, dysfunctional. So this does seem to be a recurrent theme in the history of the People's Republic of China. The big question which nobody really knows the answer to is how long can this system go on? My sense is less uh, time than you think. Because when I look at the demographics of China, the population is going to probably half between now and the end of the century. The numbers are terrible, much worse than the central projections that used to appear. Uh, I look at the economic situation. At the core of the Chinese economy is a real estate system that is no longer viable because it depended on leveraging up to build towers for, well, whom? I mean, who are you building the towers for at, at this point? As the growth rate goes down, I think it's going right down towards zero in the coming years. Uh, China's going to enter a period of, of stagnation, which I think will be very, very unsettling for the population, very disillusioning for the younger Chinese who are better educated than any previous generation, but had high expectations of what the future held for them. And those, those expectations are going to be disappointed. So my sense is that if one takes a step back and thinks about Cold War II, time is on our side, not on China's side. And the more I think about this, the more I think we should therefore be in no rush to confront China, uh, say over Taiwan, but rather take our time and let these structural factors play the kind of part that similar structural factors played in the decline and fall of the Soviet Union. That was, after all, the original idea behind containment when that was set up as our strategy for Cold War I, that, that if you just let time take its toll, these totalitarian regimes have a shelf life. And I think the, the shelf life of the People's Republic of China looks shorter and shorter the more I think about it. Can I just chime, chime in on some of what you said? The real estate thing is, is very real. And partly that, that results from a, there's no way to save for retirement in China other than through real estate. Uh, so financial repression has its way out and they build, people invest, they buy apartment buildings as investments and just leave them empty. Well, that's not healthy because there's no one to sell them to, as you pointed out. They also are, are, have a lot of, as we contemplate infrastructure and America's ability to spend gobs of money on nothing, China has spent a lot of money on infrastructure that they don't need, that you know, bridges to nowhere that turn out to be very badly built. And that's gonna show up for them too. And now a population, not only are we seeing the, the, the result of the one child policy, but uh, women in China are choosing, now that they're allowed to have kids, they're choosing not to have kids. So that, that's doubling down on that problem. But I think the, the big thing, I just wanna celebrate what you said, 
is the importance of history. Yay, history. Because I presume Decoder's books on Mao's famine are not available in China. And right. so and, but hey, I will tell you, you can get the whole trilogy. I, I, I just want to echo uh, Neil's comments. They are those books are brilliant. I learned so much from Frank Decoder, and and uh, and, and also the, this latest book, How to Be a Dictator, which is what we're talking about. The you know that these 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 regimes look strong because they have these control mechanisms, but these mechanisms themselves tend to fail over time. But there is no they, China has no memory in its civil society. There isn't a large group of people who say, hey, isn't this a little bit like what we did with the sparrows? Because nobody knows about the sparrows in China. So that yeah, you, you learned that you learned the party's version of history, right? Which is and this is the whole great, the, Orwell, right, so the Orwellian quotation we've used we've used before, right? You know, he who controls the past controls the future. And he who controls the present controls the past. Now, America maybe wallows in all of our past mistakes to an excessive degree, but at least we remember the past mistakes and have some chance of learning from them. It strikes me that China has cut off the one ability to to, to reform. That that you just if you have to glorify all your past mistakes, you're bound to repeat them. We have about a minute here left, Neil. Tell us where China and Xi will be six months from now. Well, six months from now, they'll have uh, completed or be completing that party congress that I mentioned earlier. And it seems uh, pretty certain that he will get that uh, third term, ending a a pattern of of two-term presidencies. And uh, as that uh, event comes to a conclusion, my guess would be uh, that zero COVID will very quickly be abandoned. Uh, at that point. Uh, uh, I doubt very much there'll be a Chinese mRNA vaccine that works. The ones that they have so far are not looking good as they get into phase three trials. So I would imagine a quiet impulse of Pfizer vaccines and a quick rebrand wouldn't be the first time China had done that with Western technology will be the way in which they try uh, to get out of the hole that they've been dug into. And I I think it's a technical knockout rather than a knockout, but I'll return to my (laughs) corner uh, for for a quick quick mouthwash and a towel. Gentlemen, you heard the bell. Return to your corners. Okay, come out swinging for round three. HR, you're up. As long as it's not a tag team match, I think that would be that would be con- disconcerting to our viewers. Hey, I think the, the uh, only chance that John and I had against you, HR. <laughs> Plus, we have, we have to put on costumes. <laughs> I'd like to just begin with a couple more recommendations, right? I think uh, on China, Elizabeth Economy's recent book, The World According to China, would I recommend that. And anybody who's not signed up for the, the China Global Sharp Power Weekly China Alert, you're missing out. That's the a great a great program here. Uh, at Hoover. And on the previous issue that we were discussing um, with Neil and John on on uh, on our support for Ukrainians, I think an important historical, uh, some historical context that's often missing is Russia's support for North Vietnam during the Vietnam War. And Bing West has a great essay in Strategica, the latest issue of Strategica, another Hoover publication I recommend, in which I think the numbers are, you know, they provided 2,000 tanks, 7,000 uh, artillery pieces and Russian soldiers operated their entire air defense system in in, in the north. So, so I, I think that, that it's just a, some important context. But what I'd like to talk about is, is something really Neil already intro- introduced is you know what are the long term implications for the war in Ukraine and what we're seeing in China in connection with the response to COVID. You know what should we be doing now to take advantage of what might be an opportunity? I think to to kind of win Cold War II. And and Neil, you're you're mentioning, you know, the you know how how the, to, to use Kennan's phrase on containment, you know, that that these autocratic statist uh, economic models will collapse under the the weight of their own contradictions. You know, what can we do to maybe help that along, you know, and, and strengthen ourselves relative to our competitors? So, you know, I'm just thinking in terms of you know supply chains and energy and defense. I mean, what do you think we should be doing now? That we're not doing, and and why, don't John? John, why don't you take that first, and then, and then, um, and we'll go to Neil. Well, energy is is an interesting one because there was a moment of wake up call here uh, about our supremely self destructive energy policies, which are basically uh, shut down U.S. and European fossil fuels before alternatives are available at scale. Uh, in, and Europe, of course, shut down its nuclear plants, which can I whisper a little secret? Nuclear releases no carbon. 
Uh, and they, uh, so there was there was sort of a wake up call, but um, what I've seen recently is we're right back to it. Uh, there's you know now the call is to double down on on so called on on non nuclear <laughs> uh, carbon free uh, energy before the alternatives at stake. And I've been watching in the U.S. Uh, the the um, spread of regulation. So the Securities and Exchange Commission, all the financial regulators, U.S. and Europe are deep into this project of financial sanctions against uh, US, uh, against our oil and um, fossil fuel development, even natural gas, which we need. Uh, natural gas is the bridge fuel while the renewables only work during the daytime. We're, we're still clamping down on that. Now, uh, Germany, after a little moment uh, of sanity, is still refusing to, re they could turn on the switches on their existing nuclear plants and displace essentially all of the Russian natural, natural gas tomorrow but the regulators think a 0.00001% chance of disaster is too much. So they're, they're gonna, not gonna do that. So that I had hopes for a moment of sanity to, to break out. And uh, unfortunately that seems not to be happening but that clearly is the lesson uh, of, of what we just did here. Uh, defense I think is as an interesting one. Uh, um, uh, we seem to be, uh, you know, we're gonna spend more on defense but now uh, hopefully we also need uh, effective defense spending. Uh, I once asked you about our military budget versus Russia's. Um, Russia spends 62 billion, we spend 800 billion. And you said, well, a lot of that is on healthcare and pensions, <laughs> not necessarily get anything for it. Uh, to Neil's point, you know, the, the Marines have gotten rid of tanks. So we'll see if tanks are worth it. We'll see if aircraft carriers uh, are still worth it. So we have We're to gonna spend miss them. They're going to miss them, John. Oh, good, good. I know I, 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 you, you convinced me with your beautiful <laughs> argument. In fact, even I remember reading in the First World War, they sent the tanks over and they hadn't quite worked out how to, how to uh, uh, work them with the infantry and the tanks all bogged down. And that was another bloody disaster. So they, they've always been part of uh, something else. So are we going to reshape our defense spending towards, uh, uh, you know, things that are useful, uh, I think, is, is the big question there rather than bigger or smaller. We got to remember, we're still not spending much on defense. By historical standards, 2% of GDP, 3% of GDP. <laughs> historical standards, uh, everybody spent, you know, back to the Roman Empire, we were spending 10% 10, 10 or more of GDP on defense. Well, I'm going to take a slightly different approach uh, from John, which emphasizes uh, the cutting edge of technological innovation. Cold wars are really a race to innovate at, at, at their core. Uh, and uh, that applies not just in uh, the defense sector, but, but more broadly. We have a real fight on our hands uh, with China. In some ways, it's a more formidable technological competitor uh, than the Soviet Union ever was, uh, whether it's in a, uh, artificial intelligence uh, or in quantum computing, uh, we have a race on our hands. And I think to answer your question, uh, HR, we, we need to be investing even more than we are uh, in microchip capacity, relying as much as we do on Taiwan, on TSMC, the Taiwanese company, for the high-end uh, chips is a risky thing. Uh, and I think if there's one strategic move that the US and I should say Europe uh, should make, uh, it's to really ramp up uh, the production of the highest uh, and uh, uh, microprocessors on a, a US and European soil, because this is where China's vulnerable. China imports more, spends more on importing semiconductors than on importing oil. And uh, that's the Achilles heel of the Chinese economy, that they cannot actually manufacture uh, the really sophisticated chips for themselves. Uh, and in a Cold War, it's an advantage like that that's crucial. What was it that really did the Soviet Union in? It wasn't the war in Afghanistan. Uh, I'm not even sure it was the, the stagnation of the planned economy. It was the fact that they couldn't do computers. They just couldn't do it. They couldn't match the achievements of Silicon Valley so that they had no chance of competing with precision munitions. Their, their military fell behind ours long ago and has never caught up. So I think if you're really thinking about this as a Cold War and you want to win the Cold War, that's really where you want to focus. I don't disagree with what you said, John. I agree no. entirely that the energy policy is nuts given our natural resources. But if you really want to be sure of winning this one against China, you have to make sure they don't beat us in the technological race. 
No, I, I think I want to jump in because I did a terrible job and Neil just did me one better. So I want to try to rescue myself because you're exactly right. In innovation is, is, the, is how economies get ahead anyway. Uh, and I think the war tells us it's time to stop kidding ourselves in a lot of ways. The, the, emer- the war and inflation together are a hard brick wall of reality for so many progressive dreams. Uh, and and I, I have hope that that spurs us where we want to go. Now, the answer is not industrial policy, not to run you know, the, the Chinese state system better than ours, because our government's terrible at picking winners and losers. We kind of know that. Innovation, even in our old Cold War, came, came from private sector innovation. But there are ways, in, in the last Cold War, when Sputnik went up in 1957, the US said, oh boy, our kids don't learn enough math. Well, we're, we're having a, uh, now, now we're having a new seriousness. And what are we doing? We're getting rid of algebra uh, because uh, it's too hard for kids to do. So our, I mean, our education system is a disaster. Well, maybe it's time to get serious about STEM education, uh, even in the lower and middle, middle schools. And, uh, you know, it's time to get serious about the innovation supply side of our economy. Uh, we've been living under the, the inflation and the war together bring, bring this. We can't just trundle along pretending you can throw money at every problem. In fact, you have to unleash the innovation that I, I think the economy is capable, of. not just in, in computers, microprocessors, and the five things that the uh, Communist Party of China thinks are the wave of the future. Who knows what the wave of the future is going to be? Biotech, especially, I think is one of the most interesting places. Uh, but, you know, got to get serious. So it's, it's a wake up call. Uh, to to abandon a lot of those ways we're shooting ourselves in the foot. And I think all these areas overlap, right? So just consider, you know, the, the degree to which we have to shift toward renewables over time and 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 the degree to which the upstream components of renewables are controlled by China. So you have an innovation dimension, a technological dimension that's connected to supply chains, that's connected to energy security and an energy policy. And I just don't see any evidence that we're putting together a comprehensive approach to this. And I don't mean industrial policy, maybe, can I at least maybe use an euphemism for it, maybe economic statecraft. But I see, you know, five components of that, right? You know, one is, is really controlling foreign investment in the United States, right? The only U.S. mineral um, company that, that, uh, that, that, that mines rare earths is 10% owned by a Chinese company. I mean, uh, well, I mean, why is that? How is that possible, right? The, the, then also, I think uh, what's important is going to be is, is going to be outbound investment screening. I mean, I mean, of course, for us to innovate, we need capital, but so much of our capital is going to help Chinese companies innovate, especially even those that are that are in defense-related technologies or, or in artificial intelligence, for example. And $114 billion last year, an all-time high in U.S. venture capital investment in China. And then, and then, uh, and then I think export controls play a role. Like if a company like SMIC, which is in a race to develop the high-end computer chips for the Chinese, is, is a recipient of massive Chinese Communist Party subsidies, why should we have export controls there? But I think the two themes that you, that you brought up, which is investment in our own technological cutting edge, uh, as well as education, I think, are vitally important. But I think these are some of the components of what should be a, a comprehensive strategy for us to compete more effectively. And John, I know, I mean, I, I know, I don't, I don't sound like Milton Friedman here, man. You know, or the Chicago School. But I'd love to hear what your thoughts are about what are the limits of economic statecraft, short of industrial policy, which would reduce our competitiveness, right? By, uh, by, by um, you know, reducing free market incentives, which are, are really the driver of innovation. The problem with the state cap approach is, is you tend to get it wrong. Let's take the renewables, which you mentioned. You know, why is it that we import lithium from China? Well, there's plenty of lithium actually in the United States. It's just good luck getting the permits to run a lithium mine in the United States. Uh, why oh, hey, we- 20 years, John, is the estimate it takes. If you wanted to start a mine today, it would take you 20 years. Oh, that's, uh, I would say infinity. <laughs> Uh, because, uh, you know, they're bound, there's bound to be, you know, they just actually strengthened the environmental, uh, the, the uh, Biden administration just strengthened the ability to have environmental suits on all sorts of, uh, of things. The answer is never. Uh, so we could bring those things home. We just don't want to. Um, you know, you said renewables. Let's remember nuclear is not a renewable, but it's certain, that's you know, part of the problem where we're focused on certain things. Solar cells. Turns out it takes a whole lot of horrible looking mines and a whole lot of coal powered energy to make solar cells. So we're, we're kind of reluctant to bring them here. And that's it's very hard from top down to see these. You end up building things like a California high speed train, which will not save a thimble full of carbon, but will blow through billions of dollars. Uh, so that's, you know, that's when you're doing something like the renewables transition, 
uh, which will happen. That's the trouble with the economic statecraft approach. Statecraft in the US means lobbycraft. <laughs> who's gonna get the subsidies? Well, it's never the people who actually have the efficient project in mind. Before we run out of time, I'd like to say one uh, thing that relates to a natural inbuilt advantage that the United States has in any strategic competition. And, and that is the advantage of freedom. Uh, but we have to nurture that advantage. Uh, if we don't have academic freedom, then we're not likely to be uh, innovative for very long uh, if, uh, if political correctness or wokeness dominates uh, university life. Then the more adventurous thinkers will uh, seek their fortunes elsewhere. And of course, if there isn't free speech uh, in, uh, in American uh, public life, uh, if in fact it's impossible uh, to speak your mind without incurring the wrath of the council mob, then I think we lose one of our distinctive superpowers. This is all just a very elaborate way of talking about Elon Musk, of course, who personifies uh, America's superpower in the sense that he, probably the most famous man in the world right now, as well as the richest, is just another of those uh, talented immigrants that the United States uh, has attracted, uh, South African by birth, uh, whose contributions in a number of, of different industries have been already enough to cement his historical reputation. But now, not content with space, uh, with solar energy, with uh, electric cars, uh, he's taking on free speech by, by uh, launching a, a takeover of, of Twitter. And this is a fascinating uh, moment, it seems to me, uh, because it brings together uh, our inherent uh, fascination with giants of economic innovation uh, with our current obsession with policing speech. Uh, so it seems to me that in the great uh, struggles uh, that we've been discussing, a very important battle is about to be fought uh, about how free free speech is in the United States. And it's kind of funny that of all people, it should be Elon who decides to take up the cudgels uh, for free speech. What do you guys think? John, um, are you, uh, are you uh, long Twitter under Elon's uh, 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 coming new regime? I'm, I'm <laughs> long Twitter on its improvement in the public square. I'm not long Twitter on the financials. Uh, um, a colleague of ours computed that the Twitters, that Elon Musk paid $750 for every Twitter user. Uh, good luck making that back, but um, I'm always, I, I'm wrong about a lot of these things. Good luck to him. Uh, somebody else uh, quipped, this is a great way to uh, uh, solve wealth inequality. <laughs> uh, and, and remember, uh, any any uh, Tesla stock that he sells, he's got to pay capital gains tax on. So this is going to be a great one for the U.S. Treasury. But I'm long on it for free speech. Uh, I was worried about, I think we moved on to the new topic, didn't we? I think I actually have. Uh, yeah, so I've let's, got, let's, one, let's, I just, I just got one point I'd like to make here at the, at the end, too, is you know, what Elon Musk has is a lot of capital, and, and he mobilized his capital for a purpose. And I just want to tie this to our previous episode with Eric Schmidt, who I think has done a great job in laying out the areas of technological competition and then has a special competitive studies project, I think SCSP now, where he's identifying where the opportunities are to maintain our technological advantage. More and more U.S. venture capital firms are investing in in our ability to compete more effectively. And I think that's all positive. So I just wanted to tie the Elon Musk conversation to, you know, to, uh, to really, I think the a private sector solution to, to this competition with China and authoritarian regimes. And let me, let me just make the point I was heading to, which is what we worry about the monopoly of the tech companies. And uh, we forgot about the great market for corporate control. Uh, and one of the ways in which, uh, if a company goes bad and is doing bad things is you can buy it out and set it straight. And we just saw in, in, in one sense exactly that mechanism. So go Elon, thank you for your billions. Uh, good luck uh, bringing some form of free speech uh, back to Twitter. And if you don't, well, good luck to somebody else to build the replacement or buy it out from you. Also, uh, taking it private is very interesting. Uh, there is an, ent an entire department of Elon Musk at the Securities and Exchange Commission. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and the Securities and Exchange Commission, by the way, has gone deep into climate. So now there's going to be zillions of climate disclosures everybody's going to have to send in, which is one more incentive to take companies private and, and hide from the sober regulation of financial markets. 
Hey, let's shift around four. And uh, yeah, Neil, you uh, led us in the round four, which is uh, the bluebird of happiness and Twitter. And uh, John, talking about moving things, what about the idea of Twitter being moved to Austin, Texas with the rest of the uh, Musk portfolio? Um, let's focus on two things. So I, I want you guys to follow tw- cover Twitter in this regard for me. If each of you had a couple of minutes with Elon Musk and gave him one piece of advice on how to clean up Twitter, what would it be? But then I want to turn this back into the larger question of free speech, which Neil alluded to. Uh, and I want to turn your attention to Florida, where Governor Ron DeSantis signed two pieces of legislation recently, one aimed at Disney and the second one aimed at universities and the issue of tenure. And the question would be this, gentlemen, um, it's refreshing to see pushback against the woke uh, left. But the question is, in pushing back, what is the balance between pushing back and not trampling on First Amendment rights and free speech? So, Neil, if you had a one on one with Elon Musk, what would you tell well, I didn't realize that I'd inadvertently started round four before the bell. Gosh, you're getting uh, punched Goodfellas, is, <laughs> Goodfellas is getting more and more formalistic. The, the problem that, that arose with Twitter uh, is, is pretty clear that uh, it went from being uh, the free speech wing of the free speech party uh, to being a platform on which speech was censored. Uh, in increasingly elaborate, opaque ways that, broadly speaking, lent to the left. Uh, And I think the simple uh, and obvious fix, which is clearly what Elon Musk has in mind, uh, is to get rid of these opaque and skewed rules for censorship, uh, which uh, I think uh, are are the real problem with Twitter right now, uh, and restore some transparency. There are things that aren't protected speech. Uh, you can't threaten to kill someone. Uh, I know that, that, that that goes on on Twitter because my wife's been on the receiving end of death threats on Twitter. So let's actually police the things that should be policed on the platform, the things that aren't protected uh, in American law. And let's ditch uh, the rules that say you can't tweet about the lab leak hypothesis. That was a rule that came in uh, long before uh, anybody could say conclusively whether the the virus, uh, the coronavirus, originated in a lab in Wuhan, or how about let's not uh, give a technology platform the, the right to cancel uh, a sitting president of the United States? That would be another uh, straightforward rule to pass. I could go on, but I think clarifying what the rules are, keeping them uh, as far as possible clear and transparent and simple. That's probably the single most important thing that he could do to make Twitter work uh, properly. HR, your advice to Elon Musk? It's just too quickly. One would be to figure out how to evolve it such that it fosters discussion and meaningful debate among real people uh, rather than a platform that can be used to polarize people and weaken our society and our confidence in democratic institutions. And the other would be figure out a way to, to stop foreign uh, agents uh, from using the platform to undermine, really, I think our our national security and and our, our common identity and, and our and our, our will, you know, to build a better future for our, our own society, while denying the use of the platform within those authoritarian regimes. Maybe a a combination of Skylink satellites with uh, Twitter could maybe bypass China's firewall, but then Tesla's, you know, access to the Chinese market might be at risk, might it? After that. So, I mean, I think there are going to be some really tough decisions he's going to face. um, And I hope he makes the right choices. John, I believe you're an authenticated human being on Twitter. What would you advise, Mr. Musk? Well, that's a a big question is is who is actually human? Uh, AI is getting better and better. Um, uh, So, number one, uh, you mentioned moving to uh, Austin. He has a staff problem, uh, and his staff are all in for this kind of censorship. Uh, So, I think he you know, needs, needs staff that isn't that. And then the question of, of this delicate question of the rules and so forth. One, one of the problems is of course they respond to complaints. And so you need to have some, some right to defend yourself which uh, you don't have now. Um, but I'm by and large for completely untrammeled free speech. Even those evil foreigners uh, have a right to tell us stuff as you know, I would like to be able to tell the Chinese the wonders of Frank Dakota and Milton Friedman's uh, work. Uh, so, um, I'm, I'm even more free speech than, than HR on that. But actually, running a company, good luck. He's, he's got some problems. Now, you also asked about uh, Disney and universities and so forth. Do you want to go there? Or do you want to stay? Yeah, let's, let's, go, let's shift to universities. Hey, let me just ask, would, would you have liked the Soviet Union to produce Sesame Street? You know? <laughs> I mean, I mean that's, what, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about really infecting our society with 
with cyber enabled information warfare and propaganda. I thought well, I don't think you're for that, John. I don't think you're for that. I mean, yeah, I am actually. Uh, so um, <laughs> Americans, there's a there's a lot of con artists on the uh, internet, and you know, cafe at Emptor. Uh, if, if you can't, you know, when you read something, you got to learn to be skeptical. Now I'm, uh, you know, certifying that you actually are a person. Perhaps you have to be, uh, you know, can you speak anonymously is a very interesting question, as opposed to this is actually H.R. McMaster and, and what he says. Uh, so there's some delicate rules there, but I, I like, you know, I read the New York Times and the New Yorker. I, I like to hear all sorts of uh, foreign propaganda of, of uh, ideological regimes and and read it critically and and uh, you know turn off what I think is is we all have to have critical facilities. You can't just make sure everybody hears what you think is right. Okay, let's let's go to Florida and DeSantis versus Academia. Yeah, so the Disney the Disney thing was interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, you know, and it's a nice to see a pushback by this sort of mindless, wokeism from CEOs. Uh, and I think what it revealed is, is the horrendous crony capitalism that goes on with any big development project. It's very clever what, what DeSantis and the Florida legislature did. It said, well, you're getting all these immense tax breaks. Why are you getting all these immense tax breaks? Right. Uh, so that was kind of, that was clever. Universities are harder. So there's Florida, there's also stuff going on in Texas where the University of Texas is on a tremendous woke campaign. Uh, uh, Richard Lowry is a fun person to uh, watch on this. They, they tried to set up a free market center and it was shut down. Now, of course, there, there's an instinct. There's, it goes to an instinct, oh, we'll ban critical race theory. We'll ban this and ban that. That, I think, is the wrong answer. I think the right answer is to just make sure that free speech, free inquiry, free research is maintained at universities rather than because... The problem at universities is this cancer of the uh, the staff that are taking over by the staff who is now dictating content of classes and, and not just what is going to be taught. Uh, and they know how to fight back uh, and, and undermine anything big that universities do. So I think it's a mistake to, to ban the teaching of this or ban the teaching of that as opposed to really insist on academic freedom. Now, the other thing they're doing is talking about getting rid of tenure, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and, and uh, you know, seeing as none of us have tenure, uh, we gave it up to come uh, to Hoover, uh, you know, and there's nothing wrong with being reviewed every now and then to see if uh, what you're doing is useful. Mm -hmm. Neil, your thoughts? Well, I am genuinely fascinated by Governor DeSantis because I think he is at this point the most plausible candidate to be the Republican nominee in 2024. And the reason he's plausible is that he's understood very well uh, the way in which what we call the culture war, arguments about uh, culture can be uh, exploited uh, to, to achieve political uh, gain. And he's become extremely adept at this. Uh, but it's a it's a dirty fight, the culture war. Uh, there's been a huge uh, storm over legislation introduced uh, by Governor DeSantis with respect uh, to education. That's why this whole spat with Disney began. Um, and the other side in the culture war has done a pretty good job of trying to misrepresent this legislation. I won't even use their 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 hashtag because I think it's so misleading. What that law states, I'm going to quote it, is classroom instruction by school personnel or third parties on sexual orientation or gender identity may not occur in kindergarten through grade three or in a manner that is not age appropriate and so on. That's what the legislation says. I have uh, a 10 year old uh, who's a fourth grader and a four year old is not even in kindergarten. I have no problem with this legislation. Hate on me all you like. Uh, it certainly doesn't seem to me uh, to be anything like the way it's been characterized in liberal and progressive uh, circles. And so for Disney and many other corporations to get on board with virtue signaling against this legislation certainly invited some kind of uh, slapdown. Uh, so I'm inclined to, to like the way uh, Governor DeSantis is, is playing these issues. Uh, he's taking on the left and he's winning just as he took on the more preposterous COVID regulations during the height of the pandemic and, and won on that issue too. What remains to be seen is whether he's somebody who can be equally effective on national security issues in a way that you have to be if you're going to make the cut as a presidential 
candid is. Uh, I said when I, I first encountered him and heard him speak that he reminded me uh, of uh, uh, Ronald Reagan's mean little brother, if there had been a mean little brother. Uh, but we have a really interesting uh, period ahead of us, the period when Governor DeSantis bids to be a national figure. And I think it'll be very interesting for us uh, goodfellas to watch how he does when he turns away from these culture war issues to, well, real war issues, the kind of war that's being fought in Ukraine, the kind of war that may end up being fought in Taiwan. That'll be the real, I think, the real crux of the matter. Right. So HR, the culture war is with us, uh, just as Cold War II is. But again, the question, how do you push back, especially against academia, without yourself being part of the problem and trampling, trampling upon someone's free speech rights? Well, I think it's almost like an, the anti-establishment clause, right? I, mean, I do think that we have a long tradition of not wanting orthodoxies forced upon us. And some of the earliest European settlers to this continent were fleeing the roundheads uh, during, the, uh, during the English bloody wars in England in the, in the 17th century. So I think this is where people like Governor DeSantis you know, have a high degree of popularity because who wants to be fed in orthodoxy? Who wants your children fed in orthodoxy? And of course, I think we should want them to, to, to be able to adhere to their own values and ideologies and espouse them, certainly, but don't force them on our kids. And I, I think that's that's a pretty popular argument across the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. I would just add, uh, it's useful on this, you know, Google up what some of these materials actually are. Uh, and it's fairly shocking. A, a friend of ours had a four-year-old uh, child come home from uh, nurse from kindergarten, and uh, she was in her party dress as usual and said, "Mommy, I think I'm trans." And mommy said, hmm, "What's this all about?" Uh, and it, it 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 came out that the teacher had said, "We have to all be we have to all love trans people." And the kids, said, "Well, I want people to love me, so I think I'm trans." <laughs> sort of tells you what four-year-olds understand of all this. So if you actually look at the materials, you can see how. Uh, how insane it is to be bringing these issues up at, for four and five year olds who barely understand what's going on. And I think, uh, you know, some of the reactions simply parents see what's going home. Parents saw what's going on on Zoom with the disasters of their education. But, you know, ban, book, book bans, we're turning to book bans. And, and uh, uh, you know, if you say can't teach critical race theory, well, then you're also impinging freedom of speech. And that's just not, not it's not effective and it's not the right answer. The bureaucracy knows how to fight back on that one. Right. So Texas's governor wasted no time tweeting that Disney World is more than welcome in Texas if it wants to move there. Uh, but Neil, what is your sense as to what's going on in corporate America boardrooms in terms of making the woke calculation? We saw this we saw this during the riots and we saw, for example, Coca-Cola and Delta Airlines push back against Major League Baseball. It moved its uh, all-star game out of Georgia, you know, seeing Disney get into a messy squabble with uh, Florida. Uh, do you think corporations are going to continue to make work calculations or do you think uh, uh, corporations in the aftermath of the Disney experience might dial it back a little bit? Well, I do think that the business of America is business. Calvin Coolidge's uh, famous line and that the business should uh, stick to business and stick uh, steer clear of politics as a, as a general rule. I thought Brian Armstrong said a very good uh, precedent at Coinbase when he said, there's not going to be any politics here. We're going to do the job of running our crypto exchange. And if you want to do politics, uh, there's the exit. Uh, I think that that kind of approach, which got him a huge amount of flack, uh, has a lot to be said for it. Uh, the increasingly politicized atmosphere in many corporations, technology companies, all the way through to publishers of that antiquated technology known as books, uh, has become extraordinarily familiar to those of us who've spent our adult lives on university campuses. And I'm reminded of Andrew Sullivan's uh, observation several years ago now, we all live on campus now. Uh, campus culture is, I think, uh, highly hostile uh, to free speech. Importing it into a corporation leads not just to corporations having to take positions under pressure from employees, but perhaps more importantly, it silences those employees who aren't actually willing uh, or inclined to toe the line. So I think less politics uh, in corporations would be, would be a, a highly desirable development. Uh, and I think it would be in the interests of, of corporations. I think there must be plenty of people at Disney scratching their heads and wondering, was it really worth it? 
getting into this fight uh, with the governor of Florida. So we have but about two minutes left. So um, I want each of you to answer the following question, and we'll sign off uh, beginning with you, HR. The question in this regards, uh, Musk buying Twitter, good idea, or is he to use that foreign policy phrase as he swallowed a porcupine? It depends on how it plays out. I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I, I think there's some ways nowhere to go but up, but we'll see what he does with it. Okay. John, success or porcupine? Uh, good idea for the country, for the uh, forces of competition, for the advancements of free speech. As far as uh, Mr. Musk, good, good luck of what happens to your billions of dollars. Uh, I'm not sure it's going to make a ton of money out of it, but if, if he can reform it, 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 it might work well. Uh, so the one thing I know as the longtime professor of finance is never make financial uh, forecasts. <laughs> Neil, success or porcupine? Well, I've known Elon for many years, and uh, I've learned never to bet against him. It wasn't Elon, it was Mark Zuckerberg who said that the, the history of Twitter was really a collision between a clown show and a gold mine. I think what we're going to see is whether that's true or not, uh, that there is a real potential there uh, for this business to make considerably more money than it has been making. And if anybody can pull it off, uh, it must be uh, Elon Musk. How he's going to do that and Tesla and SpaceX and all the other stuff that he does, I don't know. One possibility that dawned on me is that maybe this is just a little bit like the previous generation of entrepreneurs buying football clubs uh, and, and basketball franchises. It's ultimately his hobby. Uh, and, and, and this is a really expensive hobby that Elon now has. Uh, but on balance, I just don't want to bet against this man. It's not been a good strategy at any point since I first met him. If he wanted a hobby, Neil, he could have done it for about one fourteenth the price. <laughs> So the bell is sounded, and that is it for this uh, round of uh, Goodfellas, this week's episode. I uh, hope you enjoyed this format, this regimented format, as Neil would say. Uh, we'll be back soon with another episode. On behalf of my colleagues, Neil Ferguson, John Cochran, HR McMaster, all of us here at the Hoover Institution, thanks for watching. We'll see you soon. If you enjoyed this show and are interested in watching more content featuring H.R. McMaster, watch Battlegrounds, also available at hoover.org. I got a fever, and the only prescription is more cowbell. <laughs>